welcome to the video. Today we're going to do something really special. We're going to dive deep into the 1960s singles that opened the way up for punk a decade later. Now you probably think that everything happened in 1976 is all fresh and came out of nowhere. Well that's not strictly true. There were lots of things happening in the 1960s. There were flashes of inspiration and I found a few of those and I'm going to share them with you now. It's obviously not out and out punk bands playing punk in 1966 but you can hear what later became the guitar the drums the ideas the rebelliousness the energy that, that went into these singles and i'm going to open up a few and explain what happened and how they got going so let's not mess around let's get started <laughs> first one is the attack This was their first single from 1967. In those days, they had Alan Whitehead from Marmalade in the band, Davy O'List on guitar and flute of all things, who later went on to find fame and fortune with The Nice. Nice. <laughs> and vocalist Richard Sherman, of whom more later. This is the band that didn't have a lot of chart success. In fact, they had none. And they had high powered management, but that didn't seem to do any good. For example, they released the first UK version of Hi Ho Silver Lining several days before the Jeff Beck version, but they sank without trace. Whereas, as we know, Jeff Beck went on to make his name with his version. I see your sun is shining, but I won't make a fuss. Obvious. They broke up in 1968. In 1978, Richard Sherman reformed them. That didn't really do a lot. He went on to found a band called Hershey and the 12 Bars, which brought him to contact with me. Because, rather embarrassingly, at the time, I hadn't really heard of the attack. And, well, I vaguely heard them, but I didn't know their music or what they'd done. Hershey and the 12 Bars were blues R&B covers band and they used to do Sunday lunch times at the Cricketers and he used to hound me to put him on for a night on a Friday night. He put us on a Friday night, I promise we'll pull hundreds of people on the rest of it. And I did occasionally, well I think three times I actually tried it. The landlord of the cricketers went absolutely berserk, saying no one's gonna come. And I'm afraid to say that no one did come. But Richard was a very, um, what's the word, he was very, very confident of his own talent. On the attack, he was a fantastic singer, and some of these singles and, and tracks, which you can hear on YouTube, they show that he was in his element then. But as an R&B blues singer playing the harmonica, I didn't think he was quite as good. You know, he would turn up to do a Sunday lunchtime, which he'd get paid 50 pounds for the whole band, and they'd send round the jug and maybe get 10 or 15 pounds extra, but it wasn't a lot even back then. When you think that somebody like, and on a Friday night, say the prisoners, for example, would probably walk out with five or 600 pounds. Unfortunately, Richard died about eight or 10 years ago, I think. And um, unfortunately, he never made it big. Maybe he ought to have done, who knows. Now the next track, I think you might have heard. You really got me now. The reason we mention this is obviously the guitar, which was Dave Davies, is like the riffs, it, the whole single is like a blueprint for a 1976, 77 punk single. Except obviously Ray Davies's vocals are not quite very punky. And apparently he wanted it to be more jazzy, actually. And originally he wrote it as a blues standard and it was a lot slower. And what happened was they recorded it in the studio and because they were signed to Pi back then and and the sound, the guitar sound, apparently Dave Davies, whether he accidentally slit his, um, very technical this, Dave Davies had a Vox AC30 amp and attached to that he had a smaller amp which was a, um, which was one they used to use for practice and he accidentally, or on purpose he says, slit it with a razor blade and stuck a pin in to try and hold it back together. And that made it vibrate and that's apparently what adds to this sound on this. But going back to the story, they originally recorded it as a blues track and nobody, even Ray Davies, liked it. And so they went back to Pi and said, 
let's go back in the studio, we want to re-record this, it could be really good. And Pai said, hang on a minute, this band haven't at this point had a hit and they're not going to spend more. So anyway, the band's management paid for them to go back in the studio and this is what actually came out and let's be grateful. I'm sure Ray Davis is because it's their first number one and um, it was number one throughout the whole world and it was first of actually three number ones. Can you think what the other two were? You can certainly think of what one was, but I'm not sure of the other one. Maybe I'll tell you at the end of this video, so stick around and we'll see. So anyway, there are a lot of myths about it too. The main myth is that Jimmy Page played guitar. Now, Jimmy Page has admitted he did play sessions on various Kinks songs, but not on this one. And apparently Dave Davis is adamant and everybody says from Mick Avery, the drummer, Ray Davis and Dave Davis are insistent that it was Dave Davis playing. <laughs> While we're on that, it's interesting to note that they brought in session players to play drums and also piano, because normally Ray Davies would have played piano. And I can't remember the name of the drummer, but it was Mick Avery who apparently was playing tambourine. So there you go. Isn't this interesting? You get all the inside info here. And I like to say, if you're finding value in what I do, please like it, please subscribe if you're not already subscribed. And what I really like about these is people comment, people tell me what they think, comment down below. So let's move on, who's the next one? So, who's next? Next is The Birds, not to be confused with the American band <laughs> of a similar name. This is a band from West London and their most famous members were Ronnie Wood on guitar and Kim Gardner on bass, who went on to be, what's it, Ashton Gardner and Dyke, wasn't it? Something like that. And both Ronnie Wood and he went on to play in The Creation. They were gonna make it. They were one of those bands that were great live. At one point, The Who were doing equal billing and actually supporting them. They were known as London's top beat group, believe it or not, even though they made less than 12 recordings, I think put out three singles. None of them, frankly, bothered the charts that much. Again, you see, they were like, they had the attitude, they had the excitement. It's just a blueprint for what came in 76 and 77. The Birds were originally called the Thunderbirds, but they played a show where Chris Farlow, who just had a number one hit, was actually playing with his band, who we called the Thunderbirds too. So they made the choice before the date to change their name to the Birds. And later on, towards the end of their life, when the Birds, the American Birds, had all their hits and came here and, and toured, Ronnie Wood suggested they change their name to the Birds Birds. So who knows? Is that for the Birds? I think it probably is. So who's next then? Next is The Buzz. Which again is a mystery track because there's not a lot of information out there except that it was written by a guy called John Turnbull, which I found out is not Johnny Turnbull, who went on to play in the Blockheads, even though he did play in the 1971 film Get Carter for the soundtrack of that. You're a big man, but you're in bad shape. With me, it's a full-time job. Now behave yourself. See, you get all this information. Extra surplus to requirements, but still interesting, I think. Anyway, this was produced by Joe Meek, the eccentric, wonderful, groundbreaking record producer, who by himself, single-handedly, just about, started punk, actually. Well, in, in his own way, because he was dead long before punk started. So I've done a video about that up there somewhere, and you can watch that if you want after this. All I know about the band is they had a singer, I think it was called Alan, and they came from Edinburgh. And apart from that, the internet is empty of um, information. But can you hear the energy, the raw excitement, and coupled with Joe Meek's just way of doing, making sound, just happen is just so punky, especially for 1966. And who is next? Well, the next one is Screaming Lord Such, Jack the Ripper. Hey, 
another Joe Meek production and I've made another video going through screaming a lot such as life and my relationship with him over the years uh, leading up to his tragic death and again I'll put a link up there and you can watch that afterwards too. It's entirely up to you. Jack the Ripper, these days we don't really like to glorify serial killers, do we? Of course we don't. But David Such wasn't trying to do that. He was trying to create a horror film on the stage musically and he translated it into vinyl and basically if you listen to that and you watch his actions and if you saw Screaming Lord Such on stage before punk happened, and I did. And then you watched a punk band. David Search created another blueprint and Jack the Ripper, especially the stage antics. So, so we're getting towards the end now. So who's next then? It's the misunderstood. Find the hidden door is the track I've chosen. <laughs> Misunderstood originally came, well, the call of the band came from California and they picked up a couple of British members and they stayed in London, they recorded in London in the mid 1960s. And this is an example of what they did. John Peel, he was the one who found them when they were in California and persuaded them to come to Britain, apparently. I have mentioned them in another video. This is a recurring theme, isn't it? And I'll put a link up there if you want to do that. John Peel said they were one of the best live bands he ever saw and I'm sure John Peel saw a lot more live bands than even me and I think I saw must be thousands so the misunderstood were very good and they certainly were precursors of punk as were Riot Squad not to be confused with the 1970s punk band called Riot Squad this is the 1960s band <laughs> who for a little while, towards the end of their career, had a guy called David Bowie. I think it was called Bowie then, might be called Jones. He was their vocalist, but not, but just for one thing, I think, that they did. They were managed to start with by Larry Page, who was like a very big 60s pop manager, and later when they reformed by none other than the aforementioned Joe Meek and he recorded them and he well he gave them their sound I think that's possibly what David Bowie liked before he joined them as a fledgling pop star they were very much a cult band as were a lot of these obviously the Kinks were a bit more than a cult band but like the punk bands that followed them these bands just shone out like diamonds in the rough. Blimey, that's a bit poetic. And I didn't even write that down either. Well, thanks for watching. It's great to have you along. <laughs> After you really got me, the Kinks' next number one was Tired of Waiting For You later the same year, followed by Sunny Afternoon a couple of years later. Unfortunately, Waterloo Sunset, which is the one I would have thought, and Lola, never made it to number one they only got to number two so there you go and i think you'll enjoy this video if you want to watch that next i tell it to you of course but uh, this is what i recommend thanks for watching see you next time goodbye <laughs>